Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Hello, and welcome to our final episode on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Oh my gosh, we have actually made it. 51 episodes. That is one episode a week for a year with a week off. Man, I should have called this podcast the Catechism in a Year. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so today we're going to wrap it up by looking at the Our Father, which is like the mother of all prayers. Tertullian, who was one of the early church fathers, I think he was like second century, says that the Our Father is truly the summary of the whole gospel. Interestingly, that's something that people also say about the Beatitudes. And that makes a lot of sense because the Beatitudes teach us how to live and the Our Father teaches us how to pray. So St. Augustine talks about how the Our Father is a perfect prayer. He says, run through all the words of the holy prayers in scripture And I do not think you will find anything in them that is not contained and included in the Lord's Prayer. That seems like a pretty big call because the Our Father is quite short. But honestly, as I was preparing this episode, I was like, damn, he is actually right. The Our Father basically covers everything that we could ever ask God for. Not only that, but it also covers those things in like order of priority, This is something St. Thomas Aquinas points out. He says, this prayer not only teaches us to ask for things, but also in what order we should desire them. So the Our Father is also a perfect prayer because it is literally the Lord's prayer. It is the prayer that God himself taught us. (laughs) And that is no small thing. I mean, there are many prayers out there and they are all wonderful and good, but this is the only one that Jesus himself explicitly teaches his disciples in the gospel. And that's why it's the prayer that the church through the catechism uses to teach us how to pray. So let's go through and unpack the Our Father slowly, starting with those first two words, Our Father. Now, here's a question. Why does this prayer begin with the word our and not my? Because if you think about it, it could so easily be my, my father in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. It would make total sense to say that. And maybe we're so used to saying and hearing the Our Father that we just don't think about it. But actually, this is not the way that we tend to kind of instinctively pray. I mean, I don't know about you, but I tend to default to a lot of like me, my, I when I pray. And that's fine. But here our Lord reminds us of a couple of things. First of all, that we are in a mutually self-giving covenant relationship with God. Point 2787 says, we have become his people and he is henceforth our God. This new relationship is the purely gratuitous gift of belonging to each other. Let's think about that. First of all, we are as much God's as he is ours, right? We belong to him. This isn't just about us receiving things from God. We also give ourselves totally to him. And secondly, God, the creator of the universe, has given himself totally and freely to us. He is ours. We can say he is our God, which is an incredible, mind-boggling, humbling fact when we think about it. God has allowed himself to belong to us. It's like if you gave yourself to a colony of ants. (laughs) It beggars belief. And this fact should lead us to approach him in our prayer with total humility and gratitude because he did not have to give himself to us. He chose to gratuitously, freely. This word our also reminds us of another fact, which is that we are in communion, not just with God, but also with each other. Point 2792 says, if we pray the Our Father sincerely, We leave individualism behind. 
The hour at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer excludes no one. If we are to say it truthfully, our divisions and oppositions have to be overcome. Now, this is a big one today, especially because we tend to be quite isolated and there's a real trend towards individualism and also division, even within the Catholic Church. It's so easy to kind of default to like an us and them mentality or to compare ourselves with others or to look for points of difference. But here, our Lord reminds us that we are one. We are one church and we belong to each other. We should seek unity wherever possible. And then throughout this prayer, as we pray, we pray not just for ourselves, but the whole body of Christ, the whole church. And then the second half of that phrase, our father, the word father reminds us of our relationship with God. We are children of God adopted as his daughters and sons through baptism. We don't pray to him as anonymous subjects, but as children. And again, this is another mind boggling thing. We are children of God. And in fact, this is our deepest identity. Point 2783 says, The Lord's Prayer reveals us to ourselves at the same time that it reveals the Father to us. One thing you might have noticed today is that we often kind of over-identify with the things that we do or that we think or experience. So we might say, like, I am a vegan or I am my job or I am my politics. This is who I am. And the reason that we do that is because we don't know who we are on a deeper level. So we have to kind of cling to these superficial things, these experiences, these opinions, as though they make us who we are. But here we learn that actually, if you stripped all of those things away, if my job and my family and my talents were all taken from me, the one thing that would remain is that I am a child of God. And then we go on to say, who art in heaven. Now, this phrase reminds us of two things. First of all, that we're not in heaven yet and that heaven is our ultimate destination. When I was in high school, I had this friend who, whenever we were in a conversation and I would get distracted and like go off on a tangent, which happened often, (laughs) she would always look at me and say, eyes on the prize, Caitlin, eyes on the prize. And that's what this prayer reminds us, to keep our eyes on the prize, to treat the stuff of this world as a means to our ultimate end, which is heaven. The second thing that this phrase reminds us is of the majesty and the glory of God. Point 2794 says, this biblical expression, who art in heaven, does not mean a place or space, but a way of being. It does not mean that God is distant, but majestic. In other words, when we say God is in heaven, we're not saying that he's like off somewhere in the clouds in like a land full of fairy floss and lambs skipping through a field. (laughs) Okay, We're saying that God transcends this earth and exists in a state of total majesty and perfection that has not yet been fully revealed to us. Now, that state of majesty and perfection is not completely inaccessible to us on this earth. If we're in the state of grace, God dwells within our hearts. We carry a little bit of heaven with us. St. Augustine writes that our father who art in heaven is rightly understood to mean that God is in the hearts of the just. However, we will hopefully experience that perfection, that majesty in its fullness when we die. So in these words, we express two things. Firstly, our longing for heaven and the beatific vision And secondly, our desire that God dwell in our own hearts while we're here on this earth. So in summary, the Catechism tells us that in this kind of opening address, our Father who art in heaven, we place ourselves in the presence of God to adore and to love and to bless him. So we begin our prayer by acknowledging the greatness of God and inviting him into our hearts. And then after we've done that, The Our Father continues with seven petitions, seven things that we ask God for. The first of these three, as it says in point 2804, carry us toward him. Thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. 
And then the final four petitions are an offering up of our expectations. Give us, forgive us, lead us not, deliver us. So note the order of these petitions. We begin by asking for his will to be done, by drawing closer to him, and then we ask him for those things that we need. Imagine if we started with our own petitions before we tried to recognize and move towards God. It really would be a case of putting the cart before the horse. Like, how would we know what we truly, really need if we don't know what our destination is, what our purpose is? So the Our Father teaches us to get our priorities right. So let's go through each of those seven petitions, beginning with the first one, hallowed be thy name. Now, when we say those words, We are not bestowing holiness on God. Saying hallowed be thy name doesn't make God's name holy. God's name is holy, no matter what we do or what we say about it. When we say hallowed be your name, we are acknowledging the holiness of God. We are praising him in his goodness. We are also making a petition. Another translation of this line is, may your name be held holy. So we're asking that we might understand and enter into the great mystery of God's goodness and holiness. Now, entering into that mystery doesn't just mean kind of mentally comprehending it. It also means actively conforming to it and taking it on in our own actions. We're asking that God's name might be held holy, not just through our praise and our recognition of him, but also through our own actions, that we might reflect the holiness of God. So the first thing we ask God for is his glory and our sanctification. And this is a prayer that actually kind of summarizes all of the other petitions that we then go on to make in the Our Father. So the second petition is, thy kingdom come. And what does it mean to say, thy kingdom come? What are we asking for there? Well, we're asking for a few things. The Faith Explained summarizes it like this. It says, we pray that God's grace may find its way into the hearts of all men. We pray that Christ's words may be realized, that there shall be one fold and one shepherd. We pray too for the advent of his kingdom in heaven. So in summary, we pray that the kingdom of God may be made present to each of his children, that all people might know God, that they might know and love his church, and that they might be with him forever in heaven. We're also looking ahead to the second coming of Christ, the end of time when the whole church will enter into the kingdom of God. In an earlier episode, we talked about how the world is in that final age since the resurrection of Christ, which is like the moment of anticipation before the curtain goes up. So in this prayer, we're kind of sitting there saying to God, like, come on, God, raise the curtain of your kingdom. And then the next petition is, thy will be done. Now, notice that we say this, thy will be done, before we ask for anything specific for ourselves. We haven't yet gotten to that petition where we ask God for our daily bread. The first thing we ask for is that God's will may be done. There's this prayer that I love. It goes, may the most just and most lovable will of God be done, be fulfilled, be praised and eternally exalted above all things. Amen. Amen. That's a good one to learn and to pray regularly because it can be a source of great peace. If we truly believe that God is good and he wants what's best for us, then simply asking that his will be done will give our hearts peace because we're essentially placing all of our worries and concerns in his hands and trusting that he will do what is best. So after those three petitions that draw us towards God, we then ask for those things that we need that will allow us not just to be happy on this earth, but also, and more importantly, to get to heaven. The first of these petitions is, give us this day our daily bread. Now, the Catechism points out in point 2828 that there is an incredibly childlike simplicity in those words, give us. (laughs) There's something so trusting in that phrase. It's like a little toddler, especially since we've already asked that God's will be done. We ask God to give us the things that we need, not in like an I want the world kind of way, but just with total confidence that he's going to give us what we need. 
And then we go on to ask God for our daily bread. And this petition functions on a couple of levels. Firstly, we ask God for those material things that we need, the food, shelter, clothing, financial security that will allow us to actually carry out our vocations as Christians on this earth. Now, note that we ask for our daily bread. We don't ask for bread with a side of fries and a sundae. (laughs) I mean, of course, it's fine and good to ask for those like extra things that we want, like a really nice house or a job that we absolutely love. Okay, we're not Spartans. God wants us to be happy on this earth. But this prayer reminds us that we shouldn't totally freak out if we don't have these like materially perfect kind of super abundant lives where we're all wealthy and beautiful and glamorous and comfortable. Those things might be good and they might be part of God's plan for some of us, but they're not the priority. The priority is that we get to heaven. The Catechism in point 2831 also points out that in this petition, we ask not only for our own needs, but also for the needs of others. We pray for our daily bread. And this is an important part of our responsibility as Christians, that we pray for those who don't have the things they need, and also that we do what we can to provide for those needs. This makes me think of literally this morning when I was in Sunday Mass, This guy got up to talk about the St. Vincent de Paul Society and to ask for funds. And I was literally sitting there in my pew, like thinking about like, oh, should I give like $10 or $20? Like how generous am I going to be? And then I saw a couple of pews ahead of me, this older gentleman who like was like wizened and sort of bent over and really old. And he just quietly took a hundred dollars out of his pocket and put it in the envelope and like put it in the collection. And I was like, well, (laughs) that's like the the moment with the old lady and her pennies. And I felt very like convicted. I was like, okay, be more generous. (laughs) Now, one thing to point out about this petition is that it refers to this day, not all days forever. We ask that God gives us this day, our daily bread. Now, why is that? Well, We can turn for our answer to Matthew chapter 6. Do not be anxious for your life, what you shall eat, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So in this petition, we don't ask for total security, for all of our problems and worries to be resolved forever. We place our trust in God, we put the future in his hands, and we ask him to simply give us what we need right now. Now, this petition also functions on another level, which is the spiritual. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So by asking for our daily bread, we are also asking that God nourish us with his word. And not just his word, but also with the Eucharist. This is a point that both Scott Hahn and Fulton Sheen make, that the term daily bread can also be translated as super substantial bread. Super substantial, big word, meaning more than material, transcendent. So in this petition, we ask to be spiritually nourished by the word of God and also by the Eucharist. And then we go on to say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Point 2838 says, this petition is astonishing. (laughs) That sounds like a pretty big call. Why is it an astonishing petition to make? Well, the Catechism goes on to say, if this petition consisted only of the first phrase, forgive us our trespasses, it might have been included implicitly in the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer, since Christ's sacrifice is that sins may be forgiven. But according to the second phrase, our petition will not be heard unless we have first met a strict requirement. In other words, we cannot receive God's forgiveness if our hearts are closed to others, if we are not able to forgive them. And this makes sense if we think about it. Like we can't open the door to love of God and close the door to love of others, because it's actually the same door. There is only one door of love, and we have to open it all the way. Now, the beautiful thing here is that this is a petition. God doesn't just 
compel us to forgive other people. He invites us to ask for his help in that because it can be really hard. So in this prayer, we say, God, help me to open my heart to forgive others so that I can then be forgiven by you. Now, side note, what does it actually mean to forgive others? Does it mean that we no longer feel sad or hurt or that we have to be best friends with someone who has done us wrong? No, definitely not. Father Mike Schmitz has a couple of really good videos on this, so I'll include those in the show notes. But basically, forgiveness just means saying, I release you from your debt. I'm not going to hold you to whatever you owe me. It's almost like a direct quote from Father Mike Schmitz, so all credit to him. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to immediately trust that person again. Maybe you have to set some healthy boundaries with them, and that is fine. In fact, it's often good. Forgiving someone just means that we don't cling to our anger or demand retribution or strict justice. Instead, we offer them our love. Now, that person might need to earn our trust and our friendship again, but That doesn't stop us from letting go of resentment and offering them that supernatural gift of charity. And then in our second last petition, we ask God to lead us not into temptation. Now, this is an interesting one because at first glance, it can sound like we're saying that God might lead us into sin if he wanted to. That is not the case. James 1.13 says, God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. God would never actively tempt us to sin. Okay, that would be contrary to his nature. But God can and at times does allow us to be tempted if that temptation may provide an opportunity for us to turn back to him and to grow stronger in our faith. By asking God not to lead us into temptation, we're basically asking him not to allow more than we can handle. We're asking him to ensure that he only allows those temptations or those things that can ultimately lead us to him. And then the final petition is, deliver us from evil. And this one kind of follows on from the last petition. In it, we acknowledge that God is really the only one who can save us from evil. Not only that, but he has already won the battle against the devil in his death and resurrection. So in this final petition, we ask God to protect us from those material evils and sufferings that might lead us away from him, and also from moral evil, from sin. And there's a kind of humility attached to this petition because we're admitting that we can't do it all on our own. And actually, this can be a source of great comfort and great peace for us. Sometimes we can get so carried away with the idea that it's entirely up to us to avoid sin. And of course, we do have a responsibility to do our best and to say yes to God's grace. But also the power to defeat sin and evil ultimately lies with God. Now, the first Christians used to add what's called a final doxology to the Our Father. And the word doxology just means a prayer of praise. It's also a really fun word to say. I dare you to try it. Doxology. (laughs) And we pray this doxology. Okay, now it sounds weird. We pray this when we say the Our Father in mass. We say, for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. So this is what the early Christians used to pray. And I love this final prayer because in it, we're not asking God for anything in particular. We're simply praising and glorifying him because of who he is. We kind of end on a high note. (laughs) And then finally, we say, Amen. And the word Amen, it's not superfluous. It means be it done or so be it. It's like a a kind of stamp on the Our Father. It's a way of saying, yes, God, I affirm that this is what I am asking for. And that's important because this prayer can so easily become a kind of empty formula that we just rattle off. But it shouldn't be a formula. With the help of the Holy Spirit, this prayer should be something that truly comes from the heart. And when it does come from the heart, it can be transformative. I think I've said this before, but I remember my dad saying to me once that, you know, if he could only pray with three things for the rest of his life, it would be 1 Corinthians, 
The Our Father and the Beatitudes. And I think he is right on the money there. (laughs) The Our Father prayed from the heart is an incredible prayer. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the future of this podcast in a second. But before we do that, why don't we end by praying the Our Father together? Is that lame? That's not lame. Come on, communion of saints. Let's do it. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Awesome. Okay, so that's it, guys. We did it. We made it to the end of the whole catechism. I can't believe it. Okay, so... I am going to take about a month or so off this podcast. I'll still be active on social media, but I won't be recording episodes, partly so that I can rest because it's been a massive two years, but also partly to plan the future of the podcast. So I'm currently putting together a list of topics for future episodes um, made up largely of things that people have sent me and topics that, uh, that listeners want covered. And I'm also thinking a bit about how we might deliver the podcast in the future. So how long the episodes will be, how often they'll be uploaded, whether we'll incorporate, you know, video as well as audio, etc. If you have ideas and topics that you'd like to see covered, I would love to hear from you. You can shoot me an email or get in touch via Instagram. But I'll also be doing some kind of concrete brainstorming with my patrons on Patreon. So you can also head over there if you want to join in that. Ideally... I would love to be in a situation next semester where I can do a little less teaching and spend a little more time making this podcast during the week rather than squeezing it into my weekends. But that entirely relies on having enough patrons. We're not quite at that point yet, but we are getting close. So thank you so much to the people who are already supporting the podcast. Okay, on that note, thank you for coming on this insane journey with me. I can't believe we've made it through this 700-page catechism. Oh, okay, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye.